Hi everyone. So um, two weeks ago, I gave a graduate class here in Amsterdam to 200 PhD students about how to build, how to train a large language model from scratch in 2024. Um, I tried in this talk to highlight the dark secrets, the thing that people don't talk a lot about, but are very crucial to getting good performance large language models. And maybe to also highlight a bit what is more hype than reality. And when I shared the slides uh, afterwards, there was a lot of interest for this. So I decided I would actually re-record the call, the talk uh, and post it on, on YouTube as well. So here is our little guide to uh, building large language model in 2024. In this talk, I'm going to cover three main parts, training, fine tuning, inference. I think for fine tuning and inference, you can already find super good recipes, super good uh, blog posts and explanation online. So I really spend most of my time on training, which is the part that's, you know, mostly like dark science, I would say today. In training, you have three parts, data preparation, efficient training technique, evaluation. It's the same here. I'll spend most of my time on the first part, data preparation, because that's really the secret sauce that I want to highlight today. So let's start writing. Um, you can believe me, or you can also believe uh, much smarter people at OpenAI or Anthropic when I say that basically the most important part in your training is the data set. So I really like this blog post from James. Uh, at OpenAI, which highlight how, you know, by training many, many architectures, uh, he basically found that in the end, they all converge to roughly the same behavior, which is determined fully by the data set. So what he say is this, the it in AI model is the data set. Basically, model behavior is much less determined by architecture hyperparameter than we think, and much more by your data set. You actually say it's your data set, nothing else. Well, I still talk about architecture a little bit. And uh, Amanda Askell from Anthropic basically said say the, the same thing last week when she tweeted, um, is this emergent behavior coming from data or from the model? And basically she say, none of us has ever magically pulled anything out of the ether. It's all coming from the data set. So if you're more into uh, YouTube than Twitter, uh, I think there is a nice video that uh, jokingly summarizes all of this by Rutger Bergman, Bregman, when he say, let me play it. That's a video I think about when I read all, you know, the tech reports that are only talking about model architecture and don't say anything about the data. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water. I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's we gotta be talking about taxes. Yeah, exactly. That's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. I can actually... So, uh, <laughs> basically, for us, we gotta be talking about data. Data, data, data. All the rest is bullshit, in my opinion. So, I mean, now that I kinda planted, you know, the landscape, Let's dive in what I mean about that. Okay. I mean, it feels like I'm at a yeah. fire. Okay, thanks. Um, I think uh, another nice, well, uh, recent paper, I think, is the Yi paper. So maybe if you've been following the field, you probably saw that many Chinese team have actually trained very good model recently. And the nice thing is that they also have a very, very good tech report, much better than what we have, I would say, in the Western world, where everyone is now very shy about sharing anything. And so the, the E models are a very good model, if you, if you look at them benchmark. And uh, basically, when training them, they say that their under, underlying assumption is that when you train on extensive data of high enough quality, a standard architecture can exhibit advanced, advanced capabilities. So basically, you, you don't need yet now to, you know, go uh, look behind beyond transformers or maybe like i will be talking later like slight extension like mixture of experts if you have very good data just spend the time on carefully uh, crafting your data sets and for now stay on on one of these simple architecture that we use today I think there is a uh, extensive resources as always. I could have cited like 20 papers, but I try to keep like a, a small list of resources so you can read them uh, extensively. I think these four ones are nice recent example. Uh, the survey on data selection for a language model by Alain, uh, Alain AI is very nice. The paper I just mentioned by, by the E team 
is really great. And I think two recent data sets that were open source and shared a lot more about how they were built were the, the Dolma data set from LNAI and also uh, RefineWeb. So I think a nice thing about RefineWeb is that uh, I'm working with Guilherme, the lead author of this at, at Hugging Face. And so we'll have much more news about this data set to share. And I think it's a very nice work. So you can use data for many things. So when you talk about data, you actually talk about various types of data. You can use data for pre-training your model. You can use data for instruction tuning. You can use data for alignment, which is basically after having pre-trained your model, you really want to align it so it learns how to exhibit the nice behavior that you want. In particular, a dialogue behavior, which is one we often want to have when we interact with these models. You can also have model data more for in-context learning, for RAG training, retrieval training. And I would say each of these aspects will have different goals and will require different data. So as a rough ID, for instance, for pre-training, you want really the maximal diversity. You want to assume that your model just have no way to generalize. So if the, the, if the behavior you want at the end is not in the pre-training data, there is no way the model will discover it. You have to put it in the training data. For alignment, it's quite different. You want very clean data because you're training your model to exhibit some specific behavior. You want your model to really be very good at, you know, like a, a function call, or like you want your model to be very good at uh, dialogue. So you want the model really to train and to, to learn this uh, behavior. So usually uh, this data set can be much smaller and they can be much more carefully cleaned. In pre-training, you will want some noise, so your model know about the noise. In particular, there is a debate, you know, should you use no toxic data or like maybe no bad language data? Um, right now, I think the, the main, be, the main uh, approach to this problem by people is to use a lot of like toxic data or like a lot, a decent amount, so that the model is already exposed to this. It's a little bit like your kid, if you want. Uh, if you want to tell them that drug is bad, right, they have to first know about drug. You cannot really, uh, you know, expect them to uh, learn that this is something they, they, they shouldn't touch, they shouldn't um, be using if you don't tell them what it is. It's the same for language model in some way. We want them to be exposed to this data, to a small amount of it, so that they can learn later to avoid this and they will know what they need to avoid. Basically, assume that there is no generalization capabilities in this model. If you want to tell them anything about something, positive or negative, you have to first put it in the model. So let's talk about pre-training stage. I already covered a little bit, but basically you want to have maximal coverage. You want to cover everything. So you will train a massive quantity of texts, at least one trillion token nowadays. And I think you probably want to aim for like more 10 trillion tokens. The challenges that you want to solve here, you want to maximize diversity and coverage, and you want to maximize quality as much as possible, because this is still, you know, um, something that your model will learn. So if your model learn mostly noise, you will still get noise out. So you want to have a little bit of this, so it's kind of robust to this, but you don't want to have too much of this. Um, here is one example. Basically, you will want to, your model, a good rule of thumb is that you will want your model to know two things. You want to model to know the thing that you may want it to generate at the end. So if you want to generate knowledge about physics, you will want to put that in the model. And we want also your model to learn the thing that it might be exposed to. So you want your model to be uh, familiar with the thing that the users might input. So if you have inputs that might be noisy from the users, your model should still be trained on it, okay? Otherwise it will be out of distribution. And as I said, the safest bet here is to assume your model don't generalize. The main challenge here is maximal diversity, good quality, but still a little bit of noise, and data quality evaluation. How do you measure data quality at the billion token scale? That's what we're going to talk a little bit about as well. So here is the typical pipeline to train a model. So you start by collection. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. You want to filter by languages, which language you want to keep. And then you have a set of filters. You have basically two main type of filters. You have some filters that are more heuristic, so they are kind of rule that you wrote. And there are some filters that are more like um, ML models. So you have model that you train to identify some good quality text. 
Usually you want to combine two. And then you have a set of filters that are more semantic. The rule and the ML model are usually a little bit more on the surface level. And then you may you want to cover really the topics that you need to know about. If you want to know about physics, if you want to know about you know technology, you want to be sure that they, these are in. And so you have a step of like more topic filtering and basically be sure that you extract this topic really well. This is another example from uh, Refine Web. Huh? The first one was from Yi. This is from Refine Web, just to show you how much data we remove actually. So we start from common crawl, which is basically the internet crawled since, uh, since uh, 10 years ago. And basically we filter that and you can see that there is a lot of things that you will remove. At our first, I would say language removal. If you only keep English, English is roughly half of the internet. The second biggest language is, is usually Russian, and then you have all of, of the other in common crawl. So basically, you remove half of it when you only filter for English. Uh, you will have a lot of like duplication removal. Why do you want to do duplication removal? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that later. So wait. Um, and then you extract a little bit, and in the end, you end up with about 10% of the original common crawl sizes. So if you want to get a trillion token, that means you really want to start with a, a very large source. This is an example, this one from the, from the LNAI survey. It's roughly the same steps that you will see here. Huh? Language filtering, some heuristics, some what they call data quality, which is machine, machine learning based usually. Some deduplication. And then, uh, and then topic filtering, basically. So where can you start from? You want, as I said, something very large because you'll just keep like 10% of it. Uh, so there is two main large sources of data, I would say today. One is common crawl, one is the internet, basically. And the other one is more like for code. Usually you want to start from GitHub or something like software heritage or like a place where this has been carefully uh, already extracted from the web. You can use some curated sources like Wikipedia or books. And then in books, you have this big question, you know, like uh, should you use only public domain books, which stops usually uh, 100 years from now, so in 1924 uh, for today, or do you want to dive in more like copyrighted question, okay? So that's, that's the big, big question, I would say, for today for, for model trainers. And you have more recent trends like synthetic data generation, where you basically will ask one LLM to generate some data specifically for you. And because you're kind of paying compute for data here, you can be, you, you can scale this quite largely, right? So that's, uh, there is a full new trend on this, uh, spearheaded by Microsoft and the fee models, which were trained on billions of synthetically generated data from GPT-4. And I think it's quite interesting that you can really craft the data set in a more controlled way here, because you can say, okay, I want this topic, this topic, this topic, this behavior. And given the quality of large language models today, the quality of the resulting data is actually very high. There is even a, a recent interesting paper from Apple, which is about, you know, rephrasing the web. So you take one page and you actually ask an LLM to write it cleanly. And if you train on this data, which is very clean and still cover a lot of diversity, you can train actually three times faster because you use three times less data. It's very recent, but it's super interesting. Okay, I talk a little bit about this three source in more details because we've been releasing data set on this at Hugging Face, and I want to show you a little bit what we released. Uh, and I go in reverse order. So I start with synthetic data. Uh, we released recently, Lubna and Anton and, and Leandro at Hugging Face have been releasing a data, a data set called Cosmopedia which is a synthetic data set of 30 million samples. So that's actually billions of tokens. And it was generated using one of the best open source model today, which is Mixtral Instruct. Um, and here you can see how basically this is controlled for various seeds. Uh, so basically we give the model a, a slight, a, a small topic, you know, or a sentence from a document and you can choose where this come from. And you ask the model to, to write content you know, from this seed sample on the topic. So we took some very clean sources like the Stanford Open Courses or OpenStax, which is also Open Textbook, Khan Academy that you maybe know, and also some web data. So I would say more, more diverse data and even instruction tuning data set. And then you can ask model also to write, you know, using various 
um, language. You can ask the model to write this for college students, you know, to write textbook article on this topic for college students or for high school students. You can also ask the model to write in various styles, to write a blog post about this topic. And so you can actually have a lot of diversity, even though it's synthetic. Um, here is a quick uh, example of all the clusters. So you can do topic clustering to check that you that you you know that you cover a lot. What we discover is that we could still cover even more clusters. And I would say right now the work on Cosmopedia 0.2 is to extend this to even more cluster and to get basically more coverage. Um, and so here you can see that we train a, we, we train one billion model, one billion parameters model on this. To, to show the performances. And it's, it's really competitive with web data set, even being much, much smaller. But I would say it can, it can even be better you know, by having more coverage. So stay tuned for Cosmopedia 0.2 coming, coming in, uh, in April. Uh, if we go now to code data, there was a very nice release earlier this year called StarCoder 2 and the Stack V2. So the Stack V2 is really the largest code data set out there that's prepared for large language model pre-training. It's uh, more than 3 billion files in uh, 600 programming languages. In total, you have like billions of tokens. You have roughly 1 trillion tokens in the stack V2. So to get uh, all this data, basically, we, we didn't call ourselves. We partnered with one of the nonprofit foundation out there called Software Heritage, which is a, a nonprofit who has been focusing on archiving all code that has been out there since, you know, the 10 years ago, really. And basically, uh, there is a question, you know, when you, when, you, when, you all, when you gather all this data set, what do you do? Do you sell it to, I would say, private, you know, closed source companies, or do you partner with like an open source company to train an open source model on this? And so uh, software IOTs can reach out to us to, to partner on the training of a new uh, code, open source code, code generation model called StarCoder2 that you can use as well, and which is one of, one of the best uh, code completion model out there today. It's a very large uh, collaboration, actually, an open collaboration. So you see all the others there, uh, mostly led by uh, Hugging Face and, and the great people at ServiceNow. So really go check this out if you're interested in code data. It's by far the largest and the cleanest data set out there on this. On web data, so as I told you, we've been working uh, on with the, the lead author Guilherme of Refine Web to get a very large and very high quality web data out there. So, so basically a filtered common crawl out there for people to basically start their training from a high quality data set. So uh, this should be also out in the beginning of April, maybe already next week. So just stay tuned on this. So now that we got our data source, we need to filter it. So filtering by language, I would say, stay simple, fast text by Meta, Facebook is just great. So just use fast text. It's a great one. It's worked pretty fine. It has like all the language you may want to filter. Now that we filter by language, we want to start cleaning our data sets. So there is basically two ways to do that. Heuristics, ML-based. We started by the heuristics. The heuristic is this idea that you will count the items. So basically, if your document only have like you know two character per line, probably it's just a, it's just a bad list or like something that you actually don't really want to use in your large language model. So as a reminder, you don't want to use the thing that are neither things that your model will ever generate and neither thing nor thing that you will think your user might input in your model. So basically repetition, you know, a uh, very long repetition of single character, something that, you know, have uh, a very strange ratio of alphabetic character to uh, punctuation. All these statistics that you can extract are a way to easily filter documents. The nice thing about heuristics is you kind of know what you're filtering out. You know, you wrote the things yourself. You can really set the threshold by inspecting it. And you have a very a clear control on what, what you're Extra, uh, removing from your data set. You know what's, what's this. Um, so these are the, the advantages I told you. It's kind of controlled. It's robust. You know the prior. 
And I would say the drawbacks are that you're only relying on surface level. Okay? You're not looking in the meaning of the document. Uh, you may also remove too much. Sometimes you think you're just removing bad lists, but maybe these are also good lists that your user may want to input in your model. One way to be a little bit more flexible about that is to use stochastic removal. Instead of you know, being a one-off binary choice, you sample a little bit and you keep a little bit of noisy data. Another drawback is that you will need to carefully tune your hyperparameters here, you know, the statistics that you want to filter, and that's sometimes a, a little bit uh, time-consuming process. Another way to do dataset filtering, quality filtering, is to do machine learning filtering. So here, basically, how you do is that you will have a set of good example, a set of bad example, and you will train uh, either a classifier or a perplexity-based filtering to, um, you know, to, to classify or, or to uh, predict the next token. So classifier-based, you know, usually the, the standard one is to use a fast text classification with some engrams, and you label your documents as good, bad, whatever. Perplexity-based, you train a very small uh, language model, so you see we, we use the, this, this KN uh, old model, right? And we say that if the perplexity uh, is too high, then we filter documents. I would say the advantages here is that you have a more like semantic understanding, hopefully, from your ML model, even though we use very simple uh, machine learning techniques here. Um, and you don't, you know, need to tweak all the hyperparameter that you tweak for heuristics. And the main uh, disadvantage is that you are not really controlling what you remove, okay? You, you, you have a very vague view of what the biases are. So let me give you an example. Wikipedia, okay? If you train your model on Wikipedia and you filter based on this, Wikipedia is written 90%, more than 90% actually, by men. So you're basically also filtering your pre-training corpus to be mostly male written. Do you want this bias? Well, maybe not, right? So these are things that you, you, you still need to be uh, careful. And basically, it's really hard to know exactly what bias you're introducing. Um, a couple of notes additional on, on data filtering, very important notes, actually. You will have several parts in your training data, even if it's only web documents. You will have, you know, some part of the web data are blog posts, some part of the web are, you know, like um, tutorials, some part of these are, are companies, websites. All of these are somehow specific domains, and you want to make sure they are all, you know, um, processed in a good way. So you need to make sure that for each of these big domains that you want to have at the end, you actually didn't do something bad in pre-processing. So there is various ways to do that. You can, you know, cluster and identify a list of documents in a cluster. But just one thing to remember about all of this, and I would say it's a general rule of all good quality data processing, is that you will want to manually inspect the data. Inspect the data that you've been keeping, inspect how it is at the end, how it was filtered, is it still really readable, is your latex um, document well processed, is your PDF OCR well extracted, manually go through the data that you keep and also through the data that you remove. Did you remove something that you think is, is actually very important? You need to sample, you need to take a look. Uh, you can take a look just at the most important. So, for instance, you can sort your data by top URLs per token and just read 10 documents for these uh, top URLs and make sure that these 10 documents are really well filtered, okay? Very likely, you, you need to also craft specific uh, domain-focused hyperparameters. For instance, for your heuristics, maybe they will work well for blog posts, but maybe they will just badly filter LaTeX documents. So you can either say, okay, I craft a specific rule for this domain, or you can also say, I'll just add this domain afterwards. Uh, for instance, code, you could say, okay, I'll remove all code for web, and just I'll just add a very big code data set, but try to think about the implication of doing that, okay? You will basically remove, for instance, some mixed natural language and code documents. So you want to make sure you add this back again uh, so that your model still cover this type of inputs. Um, as I told you, you can also make use of some stochastic selection. So if a rule is maybe just too hard, too harsh, you may want to just stochastically sample in the filtering so that you keep a little bit of noise. 
gonna smooth a bit your rows. Now the duplication. Why do you want to do the duplication? Well, the idea is that you, there is a lot of duplication on the web. That's something to really be mindful and to be aware of. The web is hugely duplicated. And so uh, duplication will increase the density around some topics. Okay, Wikipedia is copied a lot over the internet. So maybe that's nice to have a lot of density around Wikipedia so that you're sure that your model has seen it a lot. But um, you also have to be aware that duplicated points, they have more chance of being memorized. Okay, They will also take more time because you will go during your training more times over the same data points. So it takes more compute during training. And do you really want that? Okay, do you really need to see that? Um, reducing the duplication. Duplication also has been shown to improve accuracy. So generally, the duplication is something that's very important and that you want to have a lot. Uh, how can you deduplicate? Well, you have a couple of uh, methods. You have more like fuzzy method, where you basically will extract some hash fixed size hash of your documents. And so you will lose here a little bit of accuracy because this hash are just a rough summary of the end grants in your document. And then you will want to filter them either by min hash, which is, a, I would say, a, quite a, um, a, a good method in general, or by bloom filters, which are uh, much stronger on the duplication because you just keep one hash, you just keep one document per hash. So it's very, it's very strong. You have a fixed size vector, which is very constraining. Um, and if you don't want to do fuzzy deduplication, you can use exact deduplication, where you will extract, you know, uh, with a suffix array, you will extract exactly all the duplicate in your document. They have both trade off uh, in advantages and drawback. Um, exact filtering is very costly in memory so because the, the, the table, the suffix array table, are really huge. Um, I say bloom filter is very, very strong uh, a filter. So usually we, we use a lot, for instance, for, in fineware, we use a lot min hash because you can, con you can, con you can control a little bit more um, your trade-off between memory and, um, and accuracy. Uh, speeding, the duplication is also uh, a very big issue, I would say, and a very big challenge. Uh, and we saw a very nice, a very interesting counterintuitive result uh, recently that more deduplication also led us to keeping only bad data. So basically, when we were deduplicating more and more, all the good data was now taken out, and only the the remaining things were just basically bad, <laughs> bad quality data that was not deduplicated, but that was just so random that it didn't fall in the duplication uh, buckets. So uh, I would say for the duplication also. Be careful, investigate what you're removing at the end and also what you're keeping. And don't be sure, don't, don't take this as a silver bullet, just like every filter out there. It's something that you should double check yourself. Now that we've finished, you know, uh, sourcing, language filtering, filtering by quality, a heuristic or ML, the duplicating uh, topic, we need to prepare the data for training. There's two main things you need to do. We need to shuffle it. Uh, it might seem as a joke, but it's still very important today. You don't want to train in the order of the um, common crawl dumps. You want a good a good shuffling of all your data. Um, and then you want to tokenize it. So recently there was a very nice video by, by Andrej Karpati on tokenizer. You should watch it if you want to know everything about tokenizer. But generally, there's just a set of good practices you should fit, you should um, be mindful of. The first one I would say is sample well through your whole data set. Uh, I would say the first GPT-2 tokenizer was famous for including in, in, the, in the final vocabulary token the name of Redditors because it was really trained on, on Reddit data only. You don't want that. You want really to shuffle so that the single, you know, the um, one single part of your data set is not overrepresented in your vocabulary, in the vocabulary of your model. Uh, for math, you want to be careful about numbers. You want to be careful that they are well, you know, you don't have like, for instance, uh, 42 as a single token and 43 as two token because 42 is much more used since uh, the Douglas Adams book. And so usually what people do is either they split digits. So you split all the, the, the digits in every, in every number. That's what, for instance, Lama do. Or you add, you know, the list of all numbers uh, manually in your vocabulary up to 
a thousand, for instance, that's what GPT uh, for they do. Then you need to be sure that your data set is big enough that every number is really uh, well represented in it. For code, you want to be mindful about tabs and spaces. They are very important, for instance, in Python. Uh, and so you want to handle them well. You want to model to know what is a double space and four spaces. So uh, just be careful about this. And for byte, basically, if you need something by default, I would say a byte level BPE is a good standard way to train a tokenizer. Um, don't fall in a rabbit hole for tokenizer. They are not the thing that will bring you to AGI. Okay, uh, this is just something you want to make in a clean way, so that you don't fall in the in the traps along the way. That you're able to process code numbers. You know that you don't have some strange uh, tokens overrepresented, but that's it. By the way, you can also use tokenizer to inspect your data sets. Can I talk a little bit about that? Uh, scaling tokenization is, is non-trivial. You want to really parallelize that well, uh, because otherwise pre-processing and tokenizing trillions of tokens can take quite a long time in the end. Uh, and so there is two main approach. The first one is well parallelizing and then finding a way to efficiently merging the post the tokenized data set and shuffling it. And the other way is that you tokenize during training. Basically, you feed the uh, direct text to your model and you tokenize just before feeding the model. I would say the, the nice thing about the first one is once your, the, 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 once your data set is tokenized and everything, stopping training uh, and continuing training and resuming training is very easy, is very efficient, is very reliable. And in the second cases, well, you can change the tokenizer easily, but usually you don't really need to do that a lot. Um, but resuming and being sure that you've, uh, you know, restarting exactly from where you were is usually slightly trickier. Now, how do you evaluate data quality? So um, that's really tricky. Uh, because we're talking about trillion size data sets, okay? So it's really hard to have some good metrics to evaluate the data quality. So a lot of this is, you know, inspecting yourself, uh, some uh, exact documents, as I will tell you, and some easy, <clears throat> I would say, one, one, one good way is training small model to test it. So typically what we've been training here, for instance, is like one to two billion size model, and you train at uh, this on, on a, like a chinchilla optimal size. Huh? You don't need to train for longer. You're not using this model for inference or anything. So which is roughly 30 giga token. When you train your model, you need to find some high signal benchmark. Not all the benchmark in NLP are high signal. What is a high signal? There is two ways I've seen it uh, being, being, being used. One way is to make sure that your matrix on this benchmark is monotonically increasing during training, okay? You want basically some benchmark where you really see your model learning, learning increasingly and not like oscillating a lot. Otherwise, depending when you stop, you will have like very different results. You want to have a low variance, which means if you train on various seeds, if you train on various, um, you know, parts of your data set, you want to be sure that you're you're roughly in the same ballpark. At least the, the, the standard deviation that you're measuring is small enough that you can really tell data set apart. So usually you will want to have two debugging data sets, one of high quality. A standard, very high quality data set is C4. It's a very, it's really a data set that has stand the test of time in terms of high quality. Uh, and you want another data set that's maybe much more complex. So the PAL is some, some, sometime an example, or you can take just a pure common crawl unfiltered. And you should see really a distance between the measurement on your benchmark on these two data sets, the performance of your train model on these two data sets. And obviously, you want your model to be above the random baseline. You know, that's also one indication of a good benchmark. So if a 1, 2 billion size model is not above the random baseline, you're just measuring noise. And there is some tricky details to make sure that you have high signal. These are some things we have in, in Lightable. But basically, for instance, if you want to measure multiple choices question, it's often the case for this small benchmark. And that's why, for instance, you have four continuation. You want to predict, you know, you want to select one of the four. Small model, what I call small model is one to uh, two billion size model. Small models really like more uh, what we call normalized likelihood. So you will 
measure the likelihood of each answer, normalize it by the length, and take you know the, the highest likelihood. And larger model, when we move to like 30, 40, even 7B model, well trained, they will like more you know lettered answer. When you explain the answer and then you say select between A, B, C, D, and the model just generates A, B, C, D. And here you can you can have nice calibration curve because you have a very clear uh, uncertainty on this single generated token. So keep this one for larger model. For small model, I would say uh, focus on normalized likelihood. So these are small model training. Another thing, talk about this a lot, but manual data inspection. Take your top domains, take your top URL, inspect ten documents for each of them. Inspect also at various stages in your. Um, pipeline and also take a look at what you've discarded okay always um, you can set up a search tool in your data set that's also very useful you can do some clustering to see and to be able also to inspect top documents per maybe more clusters than url so we have here a nice um, library by leandro uh, at hugging face called text clustering we also have a nice search tool in this so really Take a look at this library and, and, and use it if you think. There is a more uncommon that, uh, that um, I really like uh, from uh, Tevin, who was a, uh, there was a lot of people at Hugging Face, you know, who are now at, at Mistral. And Tevin, who is now at Mistral, also told me once that he used a tokenizer uh, to inspect. And basically, you can train a, a tokenizer on your data set and you can take a look at the longest token and maybe the last token, so the less, the less, the least frequent token, and see there. Okay, do you have strange things? Do you have like JavaScript parts? Do you have like name of editors? Like I was telling you, and if they look bad, that means that you have some high frequency of bad quality data in your data set. Um, here we have some uh, nice library that we've been releasing, you know, just last month for doing all of this, all of these data processing pipelines. It's called Data Trove. It's by uh, Guilherme, the lead author of Refine Web. And basically, it started as an open reproduction of Refine Web, so a very high quality filtered common crawl. And uh, what we ended up was kind of a fully fledged, lightweight library for processing, filter, deduplicating text data and basically preparing a very large data set for LLM training. We have pre-built block for all the steps that I showed you here. It's fully in Python uh, and it's very easy to set up on uh, Slurm or locally and to use remote file system as well if you need to. So take a look at Datatrove. It's a very small library, I would say, self-contained Python thing, but really you have all the basic blocks that you may want to use here. Um, when you want to evaluate your model, we have one library that works well with data trove uh, and, and the pipeline, which is called Light Evil. Uh, Light Evil is a very lightweight LLM evaluation suite, usually inspired by the amazing uh, Eleuther AI harness. I would say the main difference is that it integrates from the ground up uh, 3D parallelism that I'm going to talk about next. So basically, efficient model uh, training and inference. And you can play a lot with the prompts and the eval. Eh? So I was telling you, for instance, small model really like this, like normalized log likelihood, while, while bigger model like more like lettered answers. And so here you can play with the prompts easily. Uh, and so to see how much signal you can extract for each benchmark on your uh, specific debugging model size. Now we've talked a lot about data, so let's talk a little bit about modeling. That's the part everyone is waiting for. That's the most exciting part usually. That's the reason we're all in ML, and I'm very happy to still cover this, I would say. So what are the essential elements when you try a model? Well, there is three main things. The first one is efficiency and size. You want to fit your billion parameters model efficiently on your GPU, and you want to train really fast. So you have some recepts for this that I'm going to cover uh, quickly. Uh, then you want to train in a kind of a roughly stable way. You have to avoid instabilities, but still you want to stay really close to it. And then you have the last question, which is capacity. And that's where we're going to talk a little bit about other architecture than just the transformers. But that's, I would say, just the last part. So how do you train model efficiently, in particular, when it's too big to fit on one GPU? So when it fits on one GPU, there is no real problem, right? So your 1B uh, model, no problem. Your 7, 
13, 30 B model, they are just too big for one GPU and a decent batch size. So you need to parallelize them. Today, we have four ways to do power, power parallelism, roughly. We have data parallelism. That's something everyone has been using already, I would say. You have tensor parallelism, pipeline parallelism, and a much more recent, I would say, or slightly more recent sequence parallelism. I'm going to cover them briefly. So I would say here, my idea is more to give you kind of a overview of everything more than really dive deep because in each of these topics you could dive really deep in a technical point of view okay so this is really entry uh, level and i put some references again just select a couple of references that you can read to dive deeper in this let's start with the first parallelism data parallelism Usually it works out of the box. That's the easiest one the only challenge is the data loading to make sure that your uh, mobile replics, a replic will um, have different data as inputs. So what does data parallelism do? You take the one model and you duplicate it on several GPU, you feed it several parts of your batch, and then you just, you know, uh, match the gradient, reduce the gradients, so that you have basically a, a larger batch on three GPU, for instance, than you had on one GPU. So you can process on parallel, you know, different part of your data, and you just met the optimization step. The main challenge, I would say, is the last part is the all reduce that you use to, to, to kind of merge the gradient updates. And actually, when you scale a very large model, it can start to become a huge bottleneck. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. The tensor parallelism is when you don't want to, when you're limited in your data parallelism. So why would you be limited by data parallelism? There's two main cases. One case is basically your model is just too big to fit on one GPU. So you cannot replicate your model on various GPU. You need to split the model somehow. The other case is when your batch size by replicating the model start to be too big. Okay, so let's say you want to really scale the model, and now you start to have like a one, two, four million token batch size. Well, if you start to have a very large batch size, the model for each optimization step make um, less efficient use of each token because the batch size is so big that each token is kind of watched out in the optimization step. And roughly, it's a little bit hard to measure this limit, which we call the critical batch size. It's roughly around four to six million token. It's different for like small and bigger model, but basically you cannot really go to 100 million token batch size or things like that. So you want to find another way to parallelize to make more efficient use of your data. And so uh, one way to do that is to use tensor parallelism. Tensor parallelism is slightly more involved because you need to rewrite your model code. You cannot just rewrite the data loading code. You need to change the model. Why? Because you will divide all the matrix multiplication, all the matrices that we use in the model in two or like four or like eight, depending on your tensor parallelism uh, degree. And you will put each part of the weights, each sub part of these weight matrices on various uh, GPU and synchronization will happen after the operation. So uh, here you need to uh, rewind model code. The nice thing is that you can combine smart column and row slicing to try to reduce the number of synchronization points. Let me show you a little bit here. You have two main parts in a transformer, as you may remember. You have feed forward networks. You know, you usually have two, uh, two matrix multiplication with an activation in between can be a bit more if you're using something different than just uh, if you're using SILU. But basically, we'll have one matrix multiplication, some activation, and another matrix multiplication, OK? And here, you can basically slip, uh, split the first matrix multiplication in one direction, usually column-wise. You do separately your activation on each GPU. You don't need to synchronize. And then you gather by doing the opposite slicing at the end on the second matrix multiplication, you do a row slicing to gather again your, um, your output, your activation. You can do the same smart thing for self-attention, where you will do one part matrix multiplication in one direction, you will split the matrix, you will do like softmax dropouts separately, and then you will combine them with, you know, uh, another uh, parallel operation in the other direction. 
This way you reduce the number of synchronization points because you can do a couple of like operations without needing to synchronize between the GPU. The tricky part is always that when you synchronize, you're going through the network, and that's much that's much slower than just the computation. The last part that you can use when you when you don't want to use tensor parallelism or when you cannot scale tensor parallelism enough is pipeline parallelism. So usually you want pipeline parallelism when your like network is not fast enough to do full tensor parallelism everywhere. Okay, pipeline parallelism reduce the number of network exchanges because you will put some layers on some GPU and other layers on other GPU, and you will just communicate at the interface between two layers or like two groups of layers. Uh, so you can see here, you will put one, uh, for instance, level layer two, 0 to 3 on one GPU, level, layer 4 to 7 on the second GPU, etc., etc. Here, the challenge, I would say, is to keep all the GPU busy. So you don't want to have just, you know, one group, one GPU working for the first layers of your batch and then being idle while you have the other GPU working for the other layer, you know, as we go, as we go forward in the model. And it can be very challenging to actually keep uh, have maximal utilization of the GPU. So usually you have like complex interleaving of the forward and the backward pass. So I can show you here a little bit where you have the forward pass in blue and the backward pass in green. And you can see what we do in this case is that we will split our batch in smaller sub batch, mini batches. So for instance, we split we split a long batch in four mini batches. And when the first mini batches is done on the, on the last device, we already start the backward while we are still doing the forward pass on the other GPU for the last batches. And this way you can reduce what we call the bubble. The tricky thing here, as you probably got it, is that for tensor parallelism, you needed to rewrite the model code, as I told you. And here you also need to rewrite the optimization code, okay? You cannot just do forward and then you're lost at backward because you have parallel um, execution of a backward and forward pass. So this makes usually the code quite complex. And that's why actually we have a new library called Nanotron that's try to have this as simple as possible. There is a last way to do parallelization called sequence parallelism. So be careful because there is two use of sequence parallelism. There is one which uh, is kind of a smart way to do ring attention, to do attention in very long sequences. But the one I talk uh, a little bit about today is another simpler way. It's quite similar to tensor parallelism in a way. But instead of slicing the parameter matrices like we do, we slice the sequence this way. And the idea is um, if you took tensor parallelism here, it's the top box, we still had some operation between each tensor parallelism operation where we were not really parallelized in any way. And the idea is on this operation, which are applied independently for each token, we could split along the, the sequence. And so we could parallelize this along the sequence axis. Um, it's only interesting you're doing training usually because you need long sequences or could use it a little bit during pre-fuel for inference. Now, what can you read if you want to know more about this? There is many reference on parallelism. I try to extract, I think, the one that I think gives you the highest level overview, I would say, and cover as much as possible of this thing. I really like this first paper from Joel at ServiceNow, which is not very well known, but I think it's very interesting as it covers like a lot of challenges here, breadth first pipeline parallelism. Reducing activation computation in large transformer model is very nice one. And the last one uh, is actually the one on sequence parallelism uh, that I told you. And the last one called sequence parallelism is actually this uh, ring attention paper that I think is also very interesting, but more maybe an extension of this presentation. Now we talk about, a lot about parallelization, okay? But there is an additional thing that you need to be mindful about is synchronization. I already talked a little bit about synchronization, okay? During tensor parallelism and the thing I talk okay, a little bit about reducing synchronization. And here you, you have to be very careful about that. Well, why? Well, you have two types of synchronization. You have one synchronization, which is between various GPU, 
which is uh, basically when you when you do like a, like a, like a, a reduce operation in tensor parallelism, and you have one synchronization which is between CPU and GPU, which is when your CPU basically launch the kernel on GPU, and you want to reduce or at least you want to make sure that for both of these, as much as possible, you can do an overlap of computation and communication. So basically, if you can do something called asynchronous computation, basically where you will asynchronously start some operation and do some communication during this time, it's much better. So let me talk about two things. We, we talk a little bit during the data parallelism part about the cost of the all reduce at the end. So that's something you probably have been using already without knowing it in PyTorch, which is if you look at the distributed data parallel, so the DDP uh, in, in PyTorch, you can see that there is a very smart way to do all reduce. So let's look at here. Basically, typically you will usually do like all your forward and your backward, and then you will do your all reduce at the end, okay? Well, this is very annoying because during the all reduce, where you gather all your gradient together, you don't do any computation. You're just waiting for synchronization there. You're just waiting for your GPU to exchange all the, all, all the gradient. And that's not something you really want. You want to keep your GPU busy. So if you have a way that once every time um, one layer is finished with computing, you can already start you know, reducing. You can already start in parallel to, to computation. You can already start communicating gradient. Then you should try to do that. And if you take a look at the PyTorch code for, for, for distributed data parallel, that's something that they do. Um, another example is in pipeline parallelism. You know, we saw this this uh, this uh, forward backward reducing of the bubble, and here you can also try to you know overlap this very long here G, so this very long gradient reduction here with some you know forward pass of uh, of the next batch. And just a, a quick example and a quick note about CPU and GPU synchronization. Here, what you will want is to reduce as much as possible the number of time your CPU need to inspect the data or need to start a kernel. So we want to fuse kernel. So you want to fuse the operation that could go together, the result of your attention, your activation. If you can do all of that in the GPU without the CPU needing to say, okay, now it's time to compute the activation, now it's time to do this, you should do that. So that's usually done by merging, merging operation in single kernels. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about attention. That's very interesting because if you were already in the field like one year, one year and a half ago, a little bit more maybe now, um, we had a lot of work on designing efficient attention computation because people were really very scared by the quadratic cost of attention. Okay? And all of this disappeared now. You know, there was like all this reformer, all these very uh, uh, long attention, smart. And the main reason this disappeared was that uh, our friend Tridao at Stanford invented flash attention. Flash attention, the idea is basically you will just not materialize the attention matrix. So the attention matrix is this very like large, is the n square sequence square size matrices comparing each token, you know, to make the attention between all of them. What you could do is instead of building these very large matrices, you can just on the fly, you know, build small matrices and just keep the statistics that you need to compute your softmax along the way. And that's what flash attention does as the first step. And the second step for flash attention is that if you just compute along the way small part of your attention matrix, you may even have these small parts small enough so that they fit actually in the uh, SRAM of the GPU. So the static random access memory, the SRAM, is a much, much smaller memory, but which is really next to each chip. And this, this, this cannot be shared between processes, right? This, this has to be, this is a single memory for, for, for a group of, of, of processes. While the HBM, the high bandwidth memory, is shared by everything. So it's the, it's the HBM is this 80 or 40 gigabytes memory, you know, that you see. 
it's really large, but it's also much smaller and much lower bandwidth than this SRAM, okay? So you can compute just like your attention, not in one big memory, but in small one with statistics. And the small one can be small enough to be fitted in the very, very high bandwidth memory. And this way you can actually compute uh, attention really much faster and while using actually much less memory. So flash attention can solve somehow the quadratic attention cost of attention. And that's why we don't really care a lot anymore about, you know, a linear attention mechanism, for instance. Also because the performance were never able to match full attention somehow, just apart from sparse attention in some way. Uh, flash attention v2 was a, a development of flash attention seen still roughly two times faster. And here the idea was mostly to really have as much as possible of the computation in MATMUL flop. So you have to know something about GPU as well, which is GPU are really optimized to do matrix, matrix multiplication. So each time you do something like a division or something basically else than a multiplication, you're paying a cost. And the cost is very expensive. A division is like 60 times more expensive than a multiplication. And so, for instance, when we do softmax, we usually divide by some normalization, like some, some, number, some, some square roots of the dimension of our model. We want to keep this and do it just one time at the end. You don't want to do that every you know, on every uh, on every element of your, of your computation. So these type of things are basically what flash attention to is bringing with also a better parallelism, causal mask. If you're just computing causal mask, you just don't need to compute half of the matrix and just better work partitioning and using more better like the blocks and the wraps of the GPU. So I won't dive into this because there's a lot of to um, unfold here, but I would say it's more like a, a little bit more incremental, but it's still like very, very nice speed up. Um, so now that we have something efficient, we've parallelized this well, we have a very efficient attention computation, we want to make sure that we train well. And here, don't miss this hyperparameter search. You have a couple of very important things that you need to go over learning rate, you want to do a nice hyperparameter search, you want to make sure that your initialization is well done, you want to truncate it normal where they need to be, you want to make sure that your training is stable, but also that you're not too stable, that you're still at the verge of like, you're still training with very high learning rate. And here I would say there is very few uh, recent work on this, but there is two that I really like. There is the mu transfer work, slightly older, I would say now, but it's still very, very interesting on how to find a hyperparameter on a small model and how to scale them on, the, to, on a larger model. This work by Cerebras was uh, maybe one of the most interesting application of mu transfer. And a very interesting recent work from also a Chinese team again, but very well, you know, set of experiments. Uh, open source is this mini CPM blog post where they really try to optimize the model and to optimize, you know, the uh, scaling of activation between various parts of the model, how you want to scale the activation between embeddings and then the first layers, etc. So you should really probably you should really give it a look. What is also very interesting is that they challenged the dominant view that cosine learning rate was the end learning rate that everyone should use from now on. Cosine is still that really the gray gray default learning rate, but they use a linear plus, uh, you know, warm up and decay, and they show that they do have some uh, decent performances with that as well. And the nice thing about having a linear uh, learning rate, like a, a constant learning rate, is that you don't need to know from the beginning how long you will train your model on. And that's very interesting because the cosine kind of force you in a very specific shape where you need to decide from the beginning of your training how long you are going to train, and you cannot resume for longer. And if we find a way to have good performances with like a flat learning rate and just like warm up decay, decay is very important. That's what they show in this paper. Um, then maybe we can uh, get away uh, out of this constraint of knowing from the beginning how long we're going to train. So uh, take a look at this paper. I think they're very nice in terms of stable training recipes. And the takeaway here, I would say, is don't skip this step. Do your work in terms of research for hyperparameters. 
Now the last part, uh, that's the one usually people spend the most time on talking about. So it's a good indication that that's, it's also the least important part. But yeah, let me still talk a little bit about this. For a long time, transformers were believed to be the end architecture. So uh, maybe slightly sad, I would say, for the field that we didn't have anything new since, you know, the transformer paper in 2018. And uh, recently there was two extensions that I want to cover. One is mixture of expert. So mixture of experts reduced to transformers in the limit of one expert. So it's still slightly a stretch to say that it's a fully new architecture, but it's still very interesting as a new knob to, you know, play with capacity. Um, so basically, one problem was that until now, it was not very efficient to train a mixture of experts. So let me explain you a little bit, okay? In a mixture of experts, when you go through, uh, when your sequence of tokens will go through your model, at some point, you will have a router that will say for each token where in which experts should this token go. And experts are basically at the MLP level, feed forward. So you have basically several MLP, several feed forward layers. And you will select like, these are the number of your experts. So for instance, three feed forward layers, three different feed forward layer will be three experts. And your router will say for each token, okay, you should go through to expert one, to expert two, to expert three. Now each, each expert was designed to be able to welcome a certain number of token. So for instance, two token in this example here, okay? And if three tokens should go to one expert and then two tokens to one and one to the last one, the, the expert that would get three token was not able to welcome them all and so would drop one token. So we'd have one token that would just be not used in the computation, one input token. So that's quite strong, I would say, as a, as a um, impact. That means you're kind of ignoring a part of your input. And that led to, I would say, non-optimal performances, but that was needed for the sake of having a very uh, determined, like a um, very static, you know, matrix. And our GPU and TPU are not really well adapted to dynamic architecture. Well, recently using ideas of uh, sparsity, but not too sparse because we also know GPU don't really like very sparse matrices, but you can, they are actually quite good for block sparse matrices. So what is block sparse? It means you, it's sparse, but you have blocks and these blocks are big enough so that they make efficient use of the GPUs, you know? So they are big enough that they will fill like your, your, your mass mill here. They will have like enough to crush. Um, but between these blocks, you have like empty places. And here, this is basically what Megablocks recently did. And that's how it unlocked actually efficient uh, mixture of expert training, which is saying maybe our experts could be these blocks. They are very big feed forward matrices. And if we actually use this, we could just like repeat this block for, the, for the various number of token. And we can maybe dynamically do this sparsity because it's not, uh, it's actually just blocks that we repeat. So it's, I would say it's a kind of a low level of dynamicity, uh, low level, low enough that it can be very efficient. Uh, so that's basically uh, what kind of changed the, the, the thing here. We don't need to drop token anymore. We can just dynamically build these big sparse matrices from experts. And it actually even opened the door for something I think nobody has been really using yet, which is you could have experts of various sizes. You could add, you could have like big experts, smaller experts, et cetera, et cetera. Very interesting. And I'm really looking forward to uh, what will be built on top of this. Another interesting development was kind of a revival of recurrence model. And you have two uh, main uh, model. Well, I mean, uh, I just talk about Mamba. And the idea here is that you can, you can use like space, a state space model. So if you're just uh, out of your master in AI, you probably learn about space state model. There are these and this great model, this, this continuous model that make evolving, you know, a, a space state. And here, the, all, the smart, all the smart thing was about how to discretize this and keep this efficient. And so that was solved by, um, by Albert Gu and, and, and Tridao again from Flash Attention and how to train this efficient. And it's very funny because when you train this Mamba model, when you train it, it behaves kind of like a, like a convolutional network. And when you use it in inference, you can use it in a kind of a recurrence mode. So it's really, really fast, actually. 
Um, Mamba itself is quite hard to dive in, and I think the best entry point is, again, uh, an annotated blog post by uh, Sasha Rush. So maybe you learn about the transformer architecture from the annotated transformer by Sasha Rush a few years ago. So now you have also an annotated Mamba blog post, which is, I think, a very nice way to learn about the Mamba architecture. We're actually training several Mamba at Hugging Face at the moment with Nanotron. And so uh, it's also very easy to, to train. I'll show you a little bit there. So talking about Nanotron, um, we wanted to have a very simple library to use all the techniques that I showed you. Um, so we talk about parallelism, we talked about efficient training, we talk about being able to you know, nicely uh, iterate on um, your hyperparameter and also have mixture of experts on Mamba. If you want to gather all of this, you usually have very large library with a lot of bell and whistle. We want to, to keep something very minimalistic. So that's how Nanotron was born. So we want to keep this really under 10,000 lines of code. And we want to, to make it very fast, basically uh, train as fast as possible and also very transparent. So there's not a lot of wrapping around the things that you do here. And that's the idea is uh, it's very open, it's very transparent and you have in it like 3D parallelism, uh, gradient accumulation didn't talk a little bit about uh, various mixed precision, but it's in it. Uh, you have all the all the way to do also um, uh, smart optimizer, zero one, and all the architecture I was talking about at the end. So uh, take a look at Nanotron. It's a kind of a research code uh, that we use. So uh, it's still roughly, uh, it's still a bit rough on the edges, uh, but uh, it's a very very nice code base. Now that we trained our model, took a long time, I'm going to cover briefly uh, the, the next step. So uh, talking a little bit about that, because we also have nice open source library on this. So I want to tell you a little bit about them. Once you've pre-trained your model, you usually want to align it, which means you want to have it not as a completion model, which just you know generate the most likely tokens after the prompts, but you want to extract, you want to uh, have it behave in a specific way. So usually you want to start to have your model behave as a dialogue model, so that it uh, learns to generate answers to prompts and not just continuation. And you also sometimes want to you know have specific behaviors, or you want to uh, do some safety and you know. Um, for, like forbid or like reduce the occurrence of specific behaviors of your model. Okay, so this step is called alignment or fine tuning. And I would say up to now, there was a very uh, complex technique called RL, RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. The impressive thing about RLHF, I would say, is that it works at all. That's basically maybe the first <laughs> widespread occurrence of reinforcement learning in AI world. That's actually really useful for many, many people, uh, but it's still really, really complex. Basically how it works and the main tricky thing here is as always with reinforcement learning is the reward. So usually in reinforcement learning, you define your reward manually. It's very complex, you know, it's very full of heuristics. And that's kind of one reason you don't generalize to anything else than your uh, test, <laughs> test environment. And the nice thing about RLHF is the HF part, which is you will define your reward from human feedback. So we'll ask, you will generate some completion. We ask human to rank them and you will use that to train a reward model. Now it's very nice, but it's kind of a complex thing. As you can see here, some uh, typical uh, labeling uh, interface for human to label the, the rewards. And in practical, I would say the very impressive thing is that it's just working at well, but in practice, the implementation is very complicated. You have like four models. You have your like your model that you're training. So the DPO model, you have a base model that you still use because you want to stay not too far from it. You have a reward model that you trained on the, on the human feedback. You have a SFT model. So all of these models need to be at the same time in memory. And so you can do some smart sharing of layers, but that's basically very complex. And that's why we actually started to build a library called TRL to make this easier. Uh, and it's also very challenging in terms of fitting all of this in memory. 
Now, something very interesting happened uh, last year, which was uh, DPO, Direct Preference Optimization. And the idea here was that basically maybe your language model already know the reward somehow. And so uh, maybe it can be used without being trained as a reward model. And I'm saying that with my hands, but basically you can write that much more, um, much more precisely in an equation, which is the DPO equation here, and which is actually the, the, the DPO paper has a very nice math part. It's not always the case for machine learning papers. Sometimes the math is just there to pass reviewer to. But in this case, uh, the math is really very nice and very interesting. And the conclusion is that you can maybe just go with two models, the DPO model and the SFT model. And that's make uh, much easier training. And what we saw, what the RLHF team uh, led by uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis Tenstall and Ed Beshing, also with uh, former HF people like uh, Nathan and Nesnin, what they saw was that basically it makes training much more stable and it's actually just kind of work out of the box because your objective is much closer to a standard like language modeling objective. So DPO changed a lot, I would say, how we used to align this model. And um, there was this question maybe earlier this year, which was, is this the end of it? Do have we again move reinforcement learning out of the uh, most used uh, ML technique? Well, no, no, no. There is a revival recently of RL through uh, the reinforcement algorithm that maybe some of you know if you were working in the field some time ago. At least I was playing a lot with it for language modeling a long time ago. And the idea is that uh, at least the, the paper from, from Reka here and, and from Cohere show that uh, reinforcement and kind of more on policy RL was maybe still very, very competitive with DPO and maybe even better. So the jury is still open in 2024. Is DPO the answer or will we see back a revival of RL? We'll see. Now you find your new model, you've pre-trained it, you find you need the behavior are great, you're very happy, you think it's it's a nice model, you evaluated it as we told you, you need to deploy it. And that will be my, my last slides. Uh, it will be actually very uh, short because I think there's a lot of resources here, but maybe just something to keep in mind is that there was multiple breakthrough in inference optimization over the last few months, I would say. It's really impressive. I remember like two years ago when I was saying, okay, we might want to deploy a new model of seven or 10 billion parameters. People were like, this is never gonna work. These are just too big. Well, the reality is that today on my laptop, I can run, you know, Mistral 7B and it's just really fast. It's even faster than me talking. And there is a couple of things that made that possible. That's the things that I'm listing in these slides. The first one I would say is quantization. That's the first impressive thing. We can just quantize this model. We can move them from the floating point values that they have, FP16 for most of them, uh, Bfloat16, to quantized integer, and that just work. We lose minimal performances. We have various setup, you know, we have various techniques, uh, GPTQ, we have the techniques included in, uh, in, in LAMA CPP, the GGML, and NF4, so I put a couple of them out there. They all just work really well. I think a good default, honestly, is the one from LAMA CPP out there. It's very nice, it works well. And this basically solved use pay point also in terms of model sizes because models are much, much smaller and more quantized. Now we can do even better now with like speculative decoding, which is super interesting and it's devel a recent development called Medusa. And here the idea is that we have two models that are roughly similar, but one is much smaller than the, than the other one. And they're trained roughly on the same data set. I mean, they should be as close as possible. And the small one will actually predict full sentences and then we'll just use the big one to validate, you know, how good are these sentences and to keep, you know, the, the tokens until they start to diverge from the token that the, the, the large model would have outputted. And this means we can generate a token by bunch and just validate them uh, by the big model, by the big model, take a little bit more room in uh, memory, but not so much because the small model is much smaller and it speed up inference by a lot as well. And this basically let us use very large model on a laptop. Uh, there is a nice blog post I really like called Accelerating Generative AI with PyTorch, GPT-FAST, 
which show you all the other techniques you can use. Uh, you can compile your model, you can use CUDA graph. Basically, this is something we covered just earlier, and this is just the idea of reducing as much as possible CPU-GPU synchronization. So you put as much as possible your GPU autonomously uh, going through the layers, and you do as few as possible synchronization with, with your CPU. And it gives you even more like a speed up, really, really impressive. These are the inference techniques. Uh, a lot of them, just put it a few reference there, basically, for you to, to explore. The final step, you've pre-trained your model, you aligned it, you're very happy about the inference, you quantized it well, you distribute it. Final step, share it with the world, okay? We need more knowledge, we need more model outputs, uh, opens, we need more data set open, we need a lot more sharing the world. Uh, thankfully, uh, at Huggy Face, we've been building a place to share stuff, so use the spaces, evaluate your model openly on the open leaderboard, put this on the really great chatbot arena, uh, set up a chat for people to try it. Basically, please share all the knowledge that you've learned and all the artifacts that you've created as much as you can. That will be my only reward I'm asking you from this video. Thanks. Uh, I actually kept this question slide from my talk. Uh, I cannot really answer question on YouTube, but please put comments or like open a post on a Huggy Face or ping me everywhere. And I'm very happy to uh, answer any question that you may have on this. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye.